Hi everyone and welcome aboard today's uh, second session for Adobe Apps for Education. This session is focused on comic book creation with Photoshop and Illustrator and Sean Glomis will be leading us uh, through this session. Sean is a digital media instructor at Golden West, I think it's a community college and um, he's my person that I know for, um, for amazing comic work and graphics work and I love watching Sean's travels around the world. He goes to the most amazing Amazing places and uh, does pretty impactful things with his community so thank you very much for taking time to join us today Sean I really really appreciate that we had a fantastic session this morning and I'll just pop that link into the chat pod in just a second for you to catch up if you didn't get to see that but now uh, Sean I'm going to let's head over to you oh yeah if you do have any questions for Sean in this session please pop them in this top link pod and I'll make sure that we answer them at the end of the session. Um, it's just key. I'm just keen to let Sean go as long as he can without any interruptions so we can get through. If we do go a couple of minutes over, apologies if that, um, please feel free to drop out if you have to, but um, we may just go a couple of minutes over. So Sean, if you want to share your screen. Oh, yes, that's what I like to see, the black circle spinny thingy. Okay, hey, I'm going to mute myself and hand over to you. All right, well, thank you very much, Pip. Uh, my name's Sean Glimis, and I'm an instructor here at Golden West College in the D Digital Media Arts Program. And we're gonna be talking comic book production uh, in this workshop. And um, while this is a little bit more advanced than what I did this morning, um, I ended up doing a, a comic book cover project this morning using just Photoshop. And it's a great project for K through 12, including university level as well. So I really encourage you to go take a look at the link and go in, but I'm really going to be talking about production process today as well and kind of go through all the steps that are part of creating a graphic novel, comic book, uh, sequential art, whatever you want to call it. And I am kind of sticking to the American standards as well. Um, I said in the uh, last one we did, one of the things I brought up is comic books have only been around about 75 years in their current form, actually 76 years. Action Comics number one with Superman is pretty much the beginning of the Platinum Age, then we had a Golden and Modern, and so on, so on. So this is a fairly new art form uh, on the world, uh, uh, art, in the art world, and um, it is, I, I don't want to say it's just an American thing, but um, this type of comic book is uh, primarily an American uh, art form. So we have stuff in Japan, the Magna, Magna, and uh, the European comic scene is great. Uh, but uh, the standards that we use are a little different uh, all around the world. So what I am talking about is really the North American standards for the comic book industry. And that goes for the big publishers, Marvel and DC, uh, the Image uh, Group as well, Dark Horse, and then all the independent books out there too. And I've been working in this industry now for going almost 20 years. I started out as a hand letter. And what a letter does is kind of what you see on screen here. I'm glad I pulled this up. All the little word bubbles and all of the text, all the type that's set. And so I started as a hand letter. And I learned that actually because I went through drafting in junior high and high school. So I actually write the way you see on this screen as well. And in uh, the mid-1990s, uh, we saw a huge shift from very traditional artwork in this industry moving over to all digital. And so that's one of the things I'm going to talk about today is where the different jobs fall into this. And when I talk with uh, especially high school kids and college level kids, I go, there's more to it than actually just drawing the book. And I sometimes equate the artist to the rock star. They're the front man, the one everyone sees. It's the name everyone recognizes. But a lot of the people who work in this industry are the people that work behind the scenes, uh, the letters, the designers, the inkers, the writers, the editors. And they're the ones who get these books out there and out into the public. And we're seeing a massive shift as well in this industry from uh, traditional print paper over to digital. And if I'm not mistaken, a couple months ago was the first month where more than 50% of all comic books consumed in North America were now digital. And uh, I love it. It's, I've gotten rid of most of my books and I've moved completely over to my iPad and that's how I get my books now. But the actual process is still the same even though we're delivering differently. So uh, this was one of the links I put up there. Um, this goes into a lot more depth. I have both links up here for this morning session and the session we're in now. But I have two down here that are from last year. They're about two hours long each. I did some seminars down at San Diego Comic Fest. Uh, that's not Comic-Con, that's even a bigger one. 
and uh, really went through the nuances of lettering and all the little unspoken rules that are out there. And if you want to watch these or have your students watch them, I have all the files and everything else. And I get into some really um, heavy duty special effects using Adobe Illustrator. So my time is limited today. So as much as I would love to sit here and go through and do every little thing, I just don't have that much time. So I'm really going to focus on the process. So the, um, excuse me. The files that are downloadable, it's about an 80 megabyte download, and um, we've got some files in here that I'm going to go over real quickly. So it's a zip file, and when you open it up, we have a template in here. And uh, this template's actually pretty important, especially if you're going to be teaching any of this. Um, this. These are the standard comic book sizes. I gave it to you in the AI and EPS file. And I'm going to open up the AI file real quickly. Oops, sorry. Didn't have Illustrator open. And I do like to work in the typography workspace. Let's reset it. And so this is where I'll actually do my lettering. And uh, standard comic book size in the United States is 6.75 inches by 10.25 inches. And as I said earlier, in Europe, they go with a little bit different size. In Japan, they have lots of different sizes, Asia as well. It's all around the world. A lot of other uh, companies and countries have adopted the sequential art to tell stories but it's just the delivery is a little bit different. And there's a long backstory on why this size is here and it has to do with newsstands and racks and other things in the 1940s, but it's just kind of stuck over the years. And so this is the size we print at. I really wish it was a standard size like eight and a half by 11 or US letter standard, but um, it isn't. So anyway, this is um, a standard comic book layout in Illustrator and we're gonna be coming back to this document in a minute. There's another dock in here. This is our InDesign layout. Oh, and I'm bad, I didn't have these open, so we'll get this open. So I'm gonna throw InDesign into this as well. And this has the exact same layout. It's all templated out, ready to go. And I've been asked why I do this, why do I give all my templates away, is it's a standard. So I wanna see everyone working with the standard right off the bat. And when I teach in my classroom, I want to make sure that we don't have oddball sizes. Uh, we work a lot with DPI with our Photoshop docs. So everything is 300 DPI or PPI. And um, we work in the CMYK uh, output, but actually we work in RGB, but we output to CMYK as well. So this is our InDesign file. And I'll be coming back to it as well. And I'm going to start actually with the script. So I didn't think I was going to start off with uh, kind of a Word doc here. but in the industry, we start off with a writer, and actually an editor and a writer. So you have someone who's working for the publishing company, or if it's an independent, you might have a creator, and that person's writing a script. So they come up with a story. It's a lot like writing a television script uh, or a movie script. And I've kind of hacked this one down just to the basic pages that I've already brought up. And as you can see here, I'll just jump, we'll jump to page 10 because there's a lot going on. We have descriptions, so the writer's says, hey, this is what I want to see in the panel. The artist uses this along with their experience to actually draw out the panel with the action. And then this is where my world comes in. It's the dialogue. So the writer, they can overwrite. Uh, I've done a lot of editing in my time as a, as a letter. I get too much dialogue. I got to hack it down. I got to make it fit. So if I got a writer who uh, writes a little too much, sometimes I have to go back and work with them. And also, too, the artist. And we sometimes call that person a penciler. And they work traditionally most of the time. There are some people who work completely digital now, and, uh, but they still work the same way. They work off a Wacom tablet, and uh, they lay out the pages the same way. And we work at twice the size. So a standard comic book page uh, while we're drawing it is an 11 by 17 board. And then that shrunk down uh, to the uh, standard size that we have. And uh, a good artist will actually leave me room for the dialogue so they don't fill the entire um, panel up with artwork. Uh, the good ones do that, and the earlier I can get in on this, uh, the better off everyone is, so I can work with the artist, the penciler, and they'll go through and pencil out the entire book. Those pages are then scanned into Photoshop, and usually at 300 DPI, sometimes 600, depending on what we're doing, and they're brought into Photoshop. Now, sometimes we do have an inker, and the inker actually takes those pencils and works on top of it. And I didn't put any penciled or ink pages in here, just for uh, time and download sake, but I'll show you the page that we were just looking at is in its finished form. Oops, sorry. 
Sorry. Let's get it in Photoshop. How's that? And I'm going to reset the essentials here. Come on. Can be nice. Yes, there we go. So this is actually a finished page. So we have a penciler who comes in and pencils based on the writing that we had. So, so Alvin sits on a bench with an ice pack to his eye. The transit cop walks up. So there he is with an ice pack. And then he sits down, sits next to Alvin on the bench. Alvin puts the ice pack on his eye. And then the back and forth with the dialogue. Now they did give me a, a good amount of room to work in. We have up here, we have here. I have to bounce this around a little bit. And as we go through, the artist, the penciler draws it all out. Then we have the inker come in and work with black ink. And I'm not going to say they outline it. Inking is an art form in itself. They're working on top of the pencils. Or sometimes the penciler will ink it. This book was digitally inked. It was drawn by pencil by hand, scanned in, and then another person came in and worked on top of it. And uh, there's a few, Magnus Studio Pro is what a few uh, people use out there, but I know some people use Photoshop to do this as well. Then those inked pages are sent off to a colorist, and someone comes in and actually colors this, and renders. I like to use the word rendering, because they do a lot more than just lay down color. We have things like cuts. You can see in here, this is what we call a cut. So there's texture, there's all kinds of things that happen. Lighting decisions are also part of this. And the overall feel of the page, too, is done by the colors. And sometimes I will get the pages after they're inked, and I can start lettering on top of those. But I do like to have the finished colored pieces before I start lettering. So we have a page. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is we convert everything to TIFF. Uh, we flatten them, uh, convert to CMYK, and save out as a TIFF file. We do compression, LZW. Uh, you don't have to compress. But I've had the question asked, well, why don't you just drop the PSD file into InDesign and then output it? One of these pages, just the tip alone, I think, was, sorry, let me pull up the uh, folder here, 12 megabytes. That's a flattened file. It's 300 DPI. These do get big. If I had the Photoshop doc, it's probably around 150 to 200 megabytes with all the layers and everything in it. And you multiply that out by 32, uh, and usually a book has 32 pages in it, we end up with these huge working files that just really slow down the process. So for the artwork, we do flatten everything out, make them CMYK, and then we'll place those into InDesign. So we have the finished page here, and then this is where I step in, and this is where we're going to do a little bit of lettering here. I'm going to actually open up a finished lettered page, which is page 11, just to show you what it looks like. So this is the finished lettered page. I keep this pretty simple. If I go under my layers, tear this off so you can see a little bit better. I really just have two layers. I have lettering and background. You notice nothing's in the background. The template layer is actually my guidelines, just so I know where my live area is and I don't go into my margins. So this is all editable Illustrator. I don't outline any of the fonts anymore. You can see here, this is that first word bubble that was back in the, um, sorry, in the script. And there's lots of little things that we do, like narration. We have our word bubbles. We have our tails. This one here is actually off screen, so the cop's walking in. He's not uh, in frame yet, so he's talking off screen to the person. And so there's a conversation that's going on here. I'm actually going to letter this panel uh, in a second and go through kind of the step-by-step. -step. The font I'm using is called Jack Armstrong. And if you notice, our point size is fairly small. It's only six point. And I've had some people go, oh, that's tiny. I go, no, six point, even seven point's a little too large with most of the comic book fonts. These are based on handwriting. And uh, the way we used to letter was with a names lettering guide. We'd set it all up. We'd take our rapidographs or we'd use our pens and actually lay out all of the type. So we can go through and you can see all these are put together. We'll talk about actually doing our word bubbles here in a minute. But that's what it looks like. And the way I work is we'll place that TIFF file in the background. Now the TIFF file does not stay with the Illustrator file for production. It's only here 
for a stiletto on top of it. So what I do, this one needs to shrink down a little. Sorry, I had a, I do remember during production we had some issues. Sometimes we shortcut a little. And I'll lock it, and now I can work on top. And so this allows me to work right on top of the artwork. They're in separate layers. And when I'm all done, before I bring this into InDesign, we actually get rid of the artwork in Illustrator. So all we have left is the vector-based art. And then these two get sandwiched together back in InDesign. So it's not a very complex process here. We're going from Photoshop and a TIFF file. We're bringing into Illustrator. We work on top of it, get rid of the artwork, the bitmap file. Then we save it as an Illustrator file, and then we put the two of them together in InDesign for production. Any other graphic design that needs to be done, like the cover and those things, that's all a mix of this as well. But it all ends up in InDesign, and we produce a PDF file. Uh, and the PDF is usually what we send off. So we'll get to that in a second, but let's get into the lettering now. So I've got this document, and if I was going to use this to start off with, I'd actually delete out all of this text. I don't really need it. And I'm going to save this as test. Inside my folder. You can see this is actually an older version of Illustrator in, the, in terms of the file. I did that on purpose for people who have an older version of Illustrator and they want to use my templates. And so we'll bring in that same page. So I'll do file place. I'll go grab my page 11, get this into place, and one thing, I don't usually like doing this, I usually have my files already scaled, but we had some issues when I worked on this book, and the name of this book is Vigilante Project, you might have seen it when I pulled up the, um, uh, the script, this book actually ended up being a 135 page graphic novel with five original issues. And um, we did much better with the graphic novel than the individual issues. And that's one thing that does happen in the United States with comic books. Uh, if you go pick up a series like they just brought back Secret Wars with um, the Marvel, or for those who went and saw Age of Ultron, at the end you saw Thanos with the gauntlet, uh, the Infinity Gauntlet, which was from the early 1990s. Those books would come out, let's say six issues, around 24 to 32 pages each. They would be monthly, and then they're collected into a graphic novel. And uh, I prefer the graphic novels because you would just get one giant uh, book. For any of those that watch The Walking Dead, it started as a comic book. And we're on issue 120 something now. And they have these omnibus editions. You get 50 issues in one. It's the size of an old telephone book. And it's only 30 or $40. So here, that's how books are collected. They come out as individual issues first. And then they're rolled together into a graphic novel. And those are sold at your normal bookstores like Barnes & Noble. Um, or the larger retailers, while the individual issues are sold in what we call specialty stores, and those are your comic book stores, um, and they're all over the United States as well. Elsewhere in the world, it's a little bit different on distribution, uh, but that's how the system works here. And so when we're working on a book like this, we have to approach it in that system, and it's you can buck the system and say, well, I'm not going to do that, but your distribution channels, then uh, it's much harder to sell a book. So anyway, sorry about that. Uh, so there's some re rhyme and reason behind why we do things there. And so I want to start lettering. And so let's really concentrate on this one panel up here. And I'm going to go grab our dialogue. So we have a caption that says later. I like to copy and paste from the script. Otherwise, I may make mistakes typing. If they make mistakes writing and I use what they gave me, and I say they, that's the writer, then um, it's kind of their fault. <laughs> so if I type things out and um, it's my mistake, then I'm the one that's on the hook for it. So I've locked my background. I can start working right on top. And one thing in the comic book world, please, please, please don't use Comic Sans. Uh, I can go on and on and on about it. This is not a comic book font. Uh, it actually grew out of, uh, it was inspired by The Watchmen. If you've never read The Watchmen, uh, Probably a good time to go out and uh, pick up the book. There was also a movie made that it was actually pretty decent. 
but The Watchmen, uh, one of those big books in the 1980s that really changed graphic novels uh, when this was created, and you can read all about how this was created, but um, I see this all the time. Uh, it's like amateur hour uh, for us as letters. So we go out and go to sites like Blambot, and this is the one I'm going to send most of you to. If you want to download dialog fonts, we have you all. And any of the ones that have a little F next to it are free. You can use them for any independent comic or non-commercial use. So if you have students or you want to try using these, it's a great way to get started. The paid ones are a little bit better fonts. He's the guy who does this actually uh, really spends a lot of time uh, with the fonts. And a lot of these are his handwriting as well. And he's converted them. But you can see here there's lots of great fonts in here. Um, let me find a good one. If I was going to letter, uh, the one I'm using is called Jack Armstrong. You do have to pay for it. But back issue BB is a really nice font here. Um, I like the Y in it. It's a little different. But if you go through, there are some upper and lower case. You'll notice most of them are all uppercase. And uh, originally when comic books started out in the 1930s and 40s, uh, the letters were architects and, and draftsmen. And so we went to an all uppercase. There are times we use lowercase, usually... Uh, with specific characters. Uh, for a while, they were doing it in the Marvel books with X-Men. Wolverine was upper and lowercase. Uh, it's just to give a different look and a different feel. And different characters will sometimes have different fonts as well, depending on if they're from another country. Um, I know there was a book um, called Kingdom Come, and sorry, another recommendation. If you haven't read it, uh, go pick that up, and you can find it online as well. Um, but they had a lot of characters in the DC universe, Superman, Batman, all that, but they're from different parts of the world. So they'll use a font that's maybe a little bit more Japanese, even though they're speaking in English. Um, here's an alien font or dark arts. So if you have a wizard casting a spell, we can use that. Or if we had maybe a zombie or, um, some evil monster, we can use some of these. Or if we had a robot, we would pick one of these as well. Another really nice font, uh, digital strip. So I'm looking for fonts that will work kind of all the way through. And I usually like to stick with one, and we're going to use Jack Armstrong. It comes in four uh, faces. We have normal, bold, italic, and bold italic. So I'm going to start with Jack Armstrong. We'll bring it down to six point. Whoop, not 66, six. Just to make sure, it's usually six over seven. Yep, so the letting is seven. I'm not too worried about that right now. So we have our text in here. And I usually like to do a dot, dot, dot. This is narration. So we like to put narration in boxes. Dot, dot, dot. I'm going to grab a rectangle tool. We'll put a one point stroke, black. Whoops, I still have my text selected. Deselect before I start drawing new things. And for this one, I'm just going to fill with white for right now. And I'll put a one point stroke. And I do a lot of send behind and move forward. So I do a lot of bring to front. And I usually do my key commands, but I wanted to show you where these are. So if I go send to back, and I'll come in, I like to zoom in, and one of the things that really drives me up the wall when I'm lettering is margins, making sure we have equal space all the way around. That looks good. Same thing when I'm placing this in the panel, I'm looking for equal spacing. One of the things I like to do with narration is I'll come in and drop in a gradient Oops, should grab one first. <laughs> there we go. And I think we did a light blue. Oops. So I'll just grab a blue from here. Not too much. So I like to add a little color to this. There we go. And I can sit here all day and play with it. Nice thing is once I have one done, I reuse them throughout. So there's our narration. So let's talk about a couple word balloons here. Oops.
And this is kind of a tough one. So we have, well, this is going to be a mountain of paperwork. And then the other character says, sorry. So he's actually off screen. So I'll bring it in. Black with no fill. Paste it out. And I want to break this up into as much of an oval shape as I can. So I like to do a line center. And I start putting returns in. And I get rid of the spaces at the end of a line. So, well, this is going to be a mountain of paperwork. So that's pretty close. Maybe move gonna up be a mountain of paperwork. And I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. And you can see what I did here. I said, well, this is gonna be a mount of paper hyphen work, just to get it to fit. So I'll move that back up, put in the hyphen, the return. And now I can get this to fit in an oval. So we'll grab the ellipse tool, white, one point stroke. So we don't have to change much on that. I like to hold down the option key, go out from center, send it to back. And using my arrow keys, get this centered up. And then what I like to do is I'll come back in with my open selection tool. And I'll grab the anchors, bring it in a little bit, tighten it up so it's not a perfect oval. And once again, I'm looking at my margins, making sure. And I like the shape, but I need to make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Whoop. I don't know if any of you saw that, but I had one of the points selected. <laughs> so I'll start out. So later, the officer's off screen, so I've got a point to him, and we'll use the pen tool for this. I'll start. I'll come over to the edge. I like to click, pull, click on the anchor again, reset the point, come back up, pull in and I'll close it off. Now here's a little secret on lettering. And I've watched a lot of other people who do this. They'll grab both of these and go to the Pathfinder tool. So I held down the shift key and grab both. Go to Pathfinder. And they'll go and merge them together and send it back. The problem is, what if I want to move this later? I'd have to redraw everything. So what you want to do under the Pathfinder tool is go to Make Compound Shape. We get the same shape. We'll send it to back. But now if I need to change this, maybe I don't like the thickness, I can grab my Selection tool. Just grab this and move it. And you can see I can move, I can resize, I can do lots of stuff. And I don't have that flexibility when I'm using Shape Mode but I'm not doing the compound shape. So I live and die by compound shapes. I don't outline my fonts because I can always come back into the AI file, change them, and then they'll update themselves when I'm in InDesign. So I know I'm running a little bit on out of time here, but the other thing, I'm gonna make a tail that goes over to him. So this is an off-screen one. Here's one that, so I'm gonna have him talk. Same thing, pull. Oops, a little messy there, but it will still work. So we'll drop the white, and we'll do the stroke. Not the best tail in the world, but same thing. I'll compound path it. Send it back. Sorry, I usually use key commands. And then this would be a tail that points. And I would usually point this a little bit closer to the head. If not, I try to get it in here as tight as I can, so I can always come back in, grab, and move as well.
So I can move these things if things aren't exactly how I like it, or my artist or my editor goes, no, we need to point it to here. I need, excuse me, need to do that. I have the flexibility in my original AI file to do that. So like I said, I'm running a little short on time. So what I'm going to do is page 11 is finished. And the only other thing that I didn't jump through here, and I did it in the other video, I actually created a, a thought bubble. And they're pretty quick to build out. I would have the text in the middle. And then what I like to do is go around the edges holding on the Option and Shift key. And I do different sizes. That way I get a custom one every time. Oops, I'll have to fix that. You'll notice I got different size bubbles. I'll work my way around. So I do a lot of custom work. The other thing I do is once I create something once, I keep them in another file so I can reuse them on other books. I'll actually grab an entire lettered page and reuse parts when I'm re-lettering someone else's book or doing new work. Fix that a little bit. I'll grab all these and going back, compound shape again. So there's a thought balloon. And for thought balloons, we do circles. to the person. Not the greatest example there. I'd have to adjust them, but you can see little thought bubbles going over to him. And then I would set the text. I always set the type first though. The other thing too is looking back here on page 11, and this is where I get in with the other videos, how to actually break up and do emphasis on certain words. And um, one of the things I tell other letters is you need to, in your head when you're reading a script, you need to read the script the way William Shatner would read Captain Kirk. And you do these weird pauses and you emphasize on things that sometimes may not be what you want to emphasize. I get good writers who tell me where they want emphasis, they'll underline. So you're a hero. You just need to be more efficient. Get them down, get them done. And so that's how I'm reading it in my head. And so how can I visually take this and put it on the page? So here we go. You have some good moves, kid. There's actually kind of a break here. You're a hero. And then we, thanks. Now that's more of just a thanks, not an exclamation point. The other thing too you'll see is the I, this little pet peeve of mine. You never want to do this. Capital I's are only for like when I say I'm going to do something or you start a sentence. Lowercase i is used everywhere else. So we don't use the I with the bars in the middle unless it's I am or all uh, or um, anything that is in the first person. So we do lowercase. So there's a lot of little rules like this. We can break up words. We would hyphenate them if we can get them to fit and how they'll read as well. And down here is another good example of breaking up a conversation. So where are you going to where are you going, kid? Home, I just got off work. The train's that way. I'll walk. And you'll notice I try to fit this in so there's a natural flow to it as well. All right, so the last thing I'm going to do here is we're going to take these pieces and put it together. And so a lot of times the letter is also the designer on a book and they'll be putting it all together and getting it off to the printer and sometimes there's actually a graphic designer who takes all these elements, pieces them together, then sends out the PDF to the printer or sends the InDesign packaged files as well. So we, real quickly, just to recap, we had a writer, we had a penciler, who actually will draw out the book based on the uh, script. Hopefully the letter is getting involved then and helping. If not, you have an inker that might also be the artist. So that inker will ink it either digitally or traditionally. It's scanned in, a colorist, and almost all the time now it's Photoshop, uh, someone will color the entire book in Photoshop, and then those pages are passed on to the letter. Letter will work on top of it and get all the lettering together. Then they have an AI file, an Adobe Illustrator file, and then that isn't outlined. We can always come back and edit, and it's great when we have to do minor edits once the book's together. And then we put the two of those together in InDesign. And so, let me jump in InDesign real quick. It'll be my last thing here before I finish up. And in InDesign, we have artwork and lettering. So I place my artwork, put the lettering on top. So first thing I'm going to do is a file place. And we're going to go and grab page 11. Put this into place. Like I said, my page 11 is a little off. 
So I'm going to do something here I normally would not do. This file should be ready to go. Normally it would be the exact size, so I just drop it in. I don't have to place it or do anything else. So let's just pretend I did that. So I drop it in. It's the perfect size of the book. So my Photoshop doc is the same exact size as my Illustrator file, as well as my InDesign file in its physical size. Remember, 300 DPI, nothing below 266. And I don't even like throwing that number out there. But 266 DPI is about the lowest you could do with the print. Uh, it's a 133 line screen, but we really want to stick with 300. Anything lower, and you might be rejected by the digital as well. They don't like to see low-res stuff. I'll lock it, jump on my lettering layer, and I'll do a file place. And we're going to grab the AI file. Drop it in. And like I said, if everything was perfect, which it should be, it's off a little bit, sorry. Normally, I drop it in. It fits perfect right on top. And so you can see now in InDesign, we would just keep adding pages, lay out the whole book. So if I had other pages, and I, I do have some other samples in there of a spread and everything else. And this is off a little bit. Like I said, I picked a bad example, <laughs> but it's close enough. We'll save it. So I'll just throw it in here as my test. And if you notice, I keep everything in one folder. That way, when I output, I don't have to worry about looking for things. I'll export. We're going to do PDF print. And I'm just going to do press quality. If your printer wants crop marks and bleeds and all that stuff, uh, talk to them. It's pretty straightforward. But just for what we're using, if I was going to email this to you, I'd probably do a high quality print for proofing just because the file size will be smaller. But we want to look at press quality. We'll export. And somewhere out here. <laughs> looks like it. And there is the PDF file. So this is what we can send off to um, our digital stuff or we'd send this off to the printer as well. So as you can see, there's a lot of people in a lot that are involved in this. Some have wear multiple hats. Like in my case, I do the lettering and the design work and I send it off to the printer as well. Um, but in the end, there's a lot of different jobs out there in this industry that can come up and um, hopefully your students, you can show them a little bit of this. Like I said, take a look at the other, um, sorry, take a look at my other site. There's a lot more in-depth stuff on actually how to letter. I think I letter a couple full pages in there and go through a lot of the nuances on it. And I think that's it. Cool. Thanks, Sean. That was absolutely awesome. I've got a couple of questions here for you, if that's okay. And the first one is, uh, I think you answered it, why is the text all caps instead of regular case? We got that. Are there websites that have generic graphic art similar to Shutterstock for images? Um, are you talking about like uh, illustrated stuff that's comic book or... Um, actually, can, can you repeat that? You broke up um, I'd bit. say, right. yeah, comic. Uh, sorry. Um, are there websites that have generic graphic art similar to Shutterstock for buying images? Yes, for comic stuff, yes. Yeah, there's there are actually, you're going to probably find a lot of Japanese magnet stuff. Uh, a lot of those books aren't drawn. They use clip art, and they actually have software where you can just generate out cars and people and everything in a specific style. Um, if you're looking for more of the traditional American comic book stuff, I, I really don't think there's anything out there that you can just buy off the shelf. Um, there's some software that does it, but it is still, you know, the artist is the person generating out the uh, art. Excellent. Uh, next question. Um, Luke, yeah. Lucas wants to know, do you use symbol libraries to reuse graphic elements or is it all custom drawn? I think you've answered that. Um, I don't use libraries, but what I do is I'll have an Illustrator document open that has a lot of the work I've already done in it. So if I do a custom bubble in one book, I'll grab it and drag it in. So I kind of have this clip. It's kind of like having the old, um, you're at the old artboard and you have all your stuff glued up all over the place. I'll grab pieces and bring them in just to speed up my time. I've played with the libraries. I still like just having the one document. I'm a little old school that way. I'll have the one Illustrator file open off on one of my other monitors that has 
lots and lots of different uh, word balloons. And if you do a Google search, uh, there's a lot of people who have created entire uh, libraries of this stuff as well. But I do like to do custom work in the end. Fantastic. And the last question, do comic fonts not use smart contextual ligatures to control those kind of rules like the cat? That did not sound any normal language to me. Does that make sense to you? Um, no, actually it does. And most of them uh, are based off handwriting. If we really take a look, if uh, sorry, I know I'm, I'm not on screen anymore, but if you go back to Blambot or if you go to um, uh, Comicraft, you'll see that a lot of these are really based off someone's handwriting to start with. And um, when we're lettering, um, one of the problems is you're not going to find a lot of the um, uh, European ligatures or those types of things in them. They're usually, I hate to say it, they're based on US, um, um, the American market. So even sometimes an apostrophe or even an exclamation point doesn't exist within the font. Um, but most of them are uh, kerned real well. The letting and the tracking is already set up based on that person's handwriting. Hopefully, does that answer the question? All right, Sean. I think, yeah, that's great. I think we're all good to um, move on on <laughs> move on now. So thank you, uh, Sean. That was another awesome session. I've just put the link for both of our sessions today into the chat pod. If you registered, that will be sent to you with a link to the recording, blah, 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 in the next probably 24 to 48 hours. Um, thank you very, very, very much, Sean, and thanks, everyone, for attending. In two weeks' time, we'll see you back here for another session that, of course, I have completely forgotten at this point. I have a funny feeling, oh, yes, it's on um, using Photoshop Elements, maybe. It's a cool one. Um, I've just put a link for our catalogue up there so you can um, have, a, have a look and see what we're at. So thanks for joining us today, everyone. Have a wonderful evening or day or night or wherever you are. Enjoy it and make it a good one. So thanks, everyone. See you in two weeks. Thank you, Sean. Did you want to end thank off? You. No, I just thank you to everyone. And if you have any questions, please uh, find me on my website. It's easy to find out there. And uh, I'm going to be more than happy to help anybody. Okay, take care, everyone. See you later. Bye. All right, Sean. Well done. That's, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on.